So I'm Mike Harris, and I would like to introduce the moderator for today's panel, uh, Professor Chung Lee Yuang. Uh, you'll be happy to know that she's actually the former student of today's distinguished lecturer. So at this point, I'll turn the mic over to Professor Yuang. Thank you, Mike, uh, and it's a great honor to moderate this panel today. And for today, we are going to focus on the future of electrochemical storage. And I was told that we should go through the agenda very f f first very quickly. So what we are going to do is we'll have a brief overview of electrochemical storage, then I'll introduce you to our distinguished panelists here. And then we'll have panel discussion, and then we'll open the forum to everyone here. So we'll take any questions that you may have regarding electrochemical storage. So we'll start by providing you my overview of electrochemical storage by providing you a, a, a stack of pictures. So when we think about electrochemical storage, we think about fancy cars that Tesla produce. We think about the grids that store energy that actually power our house, and we use them on a daily basis, including smartphones, and it's very popular used in health industry, all those tiny machines. So the machine that you are looking at is actually a pacemaker that gets implanted in, uh, in people's heart. And there are those batteries that we buy from grocery store. So this is my overview of electrochemical storage, and we know we are always complaining how often we need to charge our cell phone. So that's why we gathered this panel together, so we can get the scientific perspective of how we can get more powerful electrochemical storage units. So we'll start by introducing our panelists. So you, you, you've already heard from Mike, so we have Professor Lyndon Archer here from Cornell. And on my right-hand side, we have Professor Edwin Garcia from Material Science and Professor Amy McCormick from Mechanical Engineering, Professor Vilas Paul from Chemical Engineering, and Professor Ke Jie Zhao from Mechanical Engineering. And we leave the best to the last. We have Dr. James Fleetwood from the Battery Innovation Center here at Indianapolis. So we're, we're going to start our panel by having Adwin introduce his current research. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I guess to, to introduce myself, uh, I did my undergraduate in the University of Mexico in, in, in Mexico. I got that degree of physics. Uh, then I went to MIT to get my master's and my PhD in material science. Uh, there I work with uh, Craig Carter uh, and uh, I also touched, uh, 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 chatted briefly with Yetming Chang on, on aspects of rechargeable batteries as well. Uh, uh, my work was mostly on the modeling and simulation of, of uh, microstructurally complex materials with electrical fields. Then I had the opportunity to work on the development of software, open source software at NIST. And uh, then uh, I was very lucky to be, get hired at Purdue, where I became an assistant, an, osi an associate, and now a full professor. Um, is that a green one? There you go. OK, so this is just a, 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 a slide show, summarizing the people actually doing the work in my group. Uh, uh, all doctoral students. Uh, really are working on different aspects, not only of rechargeable batteries, but in general, we have a, a knack for microstructure evolution, for, uh, for phase transformations, for kinetics and thermodynamics. And the, the, the two postdoctoral researchers are, uh, really help uh, also uh, move this forward. Uh, I, I do have to also, always to thank my, uh, the support of my, the people that fund me. Uh, these are the, my current areas of research. Uh, at the bottom, you can see well, one big project that I have is kinetics of flash centering, where basically you have ions and, and complex granular materials, how charge is going to it. That's what those yellow uh, 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 networks that you see there, the microstructure evolution of ferroelectrics, some work of grain growth. Uh, but as you can see the top, basically the top half of the slide corresponds to trying to understand the microstructural designs of battery materials, basically how different types of granular structures uh, impact the the, the performance and, and, and degradation of rechargeable batteries. That's mostly what I do. And uh, I even gave uh, my own uh, take on, on dendrite growth, which uh, I was very excited to hear today in, in today's presentation. So uh, that's me and uh, Amy. Oh, did you want to talk about it? 
Oh, yes, I forgot about that like, completely. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, uh, fundamentally what, what we do in my group is try to bring what happens at the most fundamental length scale and bring it up from, say, the particle level, the mesoscale level, to see what happens when you have multiple particles brought, brought together, how that leads to microstructural properties such as tortuosity, uh, transport properties. And when you have many of them that become untractable to specially resolve them, then we start looking at the sample level where we have, we have to account for, uh, for tortuosities, areas densities, and then all, the, all that variability, how it impacts all the way up to the cell module, and including the real randomness and, and complexity behavior that occurs in the inroad. You can see that little plot that you see on the top, that's the input of what you should put actually on a real battery, where you have currents with all these complex shapes every single time you, you hit a brake on an electric vehicle or, a, or you're trying to recharge it on the fly. They, those should be incorporated and I'll, uh, you would have to include all the single crystal effects in order to be able to predict the, the performance and degradation. Uh, and I, I put that as, as the challenges that my group faces as we, as we go up. And I think that's finally it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Amy Marconet, and I'm an associate professor here at Purdue. Uh, a little bit about my background is up there, but I did my master's and my PhD at Stanford on nanoscale heat transfer. And then I spent a year at MIT working as a postdoc on thermal transport and more, I would say, soft materials. After that, I started here as an assistant professor, and now I'm tenured. And my lab is the Marconet Thermal and Energy Conversion Lab. So we work in a broad space on heat transfer problems, energy storage problems, et cetera. And I have a, a wide number of projects. Today, I'll just talk a little bit about our work and motivation for work on electrochemical energy storage. Uh, so here's a brief snapshot of some of my grad students. They're the ones who do the hard work in the lab. And uh, here's my take. I think I have a few orders of magnitude more in length scales uh, on my chart here. But we work at, at trying to analyze the heat transfer in electrochemical systems across the length scales. And so at the micro and nano scale, we focus on how the, the particles and grains impact the thermal transport and it, how we can affect the structure of the electrodes through the processing steps. So there's an example there of a shear cell where we can control shearing of granular particles similar to how electrodes are made and try to understand the thermal transport through this porous structure. At the mesoscale there, say from a, a few microns to tens to hundreds of microns, we work on thermal property analysis, trying to characterize the thermal conductivity and the heat generation within the electrodes of batteries. So I show one example of a measurement technique that we've developed to characterize the thermal conductivity or the effective thermal conductivity of individual electrode layers. And we were one of the first groups to actually directly measure the thermal interface resistance between layers of the battery stack and especially between the battery stack and the case, which was important for a NASA application. And then at the macro scale, we really want to understand how these systems integrate into um, systems like electric vehicles and understand how you get heat out of these systems. So we do some thermal performance analysis of cells during operation, and then we are, uh, hope to integrate those results into models of performance. So I'll pass it on then. Pass it. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Vilas Fol, Faculty of Chemical Engineering. I joined here 2014, January. Uh, I am from Pune University. I did my two masters, Master of Science and Master of Philosophy degrees in chemistry from Pune University, which is also called as Oscar of the East. Then I moved to Israel, where I did my PhD under uh, Professor uh, Doran Arbok and uh, Gedan Ken. And as everybody knows, Doran Arbok is the best electrochemist in the world. He really dig down the electrochemistry very well. Then I did postdoc in a solar cell, disensitized solar cell with uh, Professor Ari Zaban from the same university back in 2005 and 6. Then I moved to Argonne National Lab as a director, uh, director's postdoctoral fellow. Followed by that, I was an uh, assistant material scientist for a year and then became a material scientist. And I worked with Michael Thakre, who is also a pioneer uh, in uh, batteries, typically cathode science and technology. And then I joined Purdue. Oh, 
This is my group in 2019 summer. Now there are more students joined uh, to my group very recently. Uh, so we do work on a variety of batteries, uh, such as lithium, potassium, sodium. As you know that Elon Musk is busy in uh, making the Giga factory and putting the batteries everywhere in the cars. But my small group is busy actually making very small batteries and putting in the small toy cars that can run my son's toy. Uh, last year we played that uh, in the snow. This year there is no snow, so we couldn't play. But uh, we do take help of Battery Innovation Center uh, with uh, James, and he make a uh, pouch cell for us. At some point, we are dreaming that our batteries should be sitting in all your devices, including cell phone and electric vehicles. So that's the objective of our pubs, or university battery systems. So as you know that there are four or five unique challenges that we have to tackle, and that can help you to generate some of the questions. So batteries are very expensive, still they are expensive, we want to make them inexpensive, so we have to go with earth abundant and inexpensive materials from the periodic table. Safety is a paramount and that is the core of my lab, uh, thermal safety, mechanical safety, vibrational safety kind of aspects. Uh, we do work routinely for all the electrochemistries one can develop. Battery life is typically very small, and that is due to the electrochemistry that we were hearing today. Electrolyte is highly corrosive. Uh, so typically battery life is three to five years. We want to have them for 15 years. Battery also does not like very low or high temperature. They are like human beings. They are preferring to stay in the uh, room temperature because of the electrolyte that boils at high temperature and freezes at low temperature. And now we are around uh, 7.8 billion people on Earth, and we already have 15 billion batteries with us, and we do not know how to recycle them. So we are also having another new challenge, how to recycle batteries. And we have to tackle all those problems together in order to make our future better. Otherwise, it looks like a broken glass. Now my uh, lab works on a variety of things. We do work on lithium and traditional electrochemistry that will be there, that is there. Uh, lithium is abundant, light, uh, lithium is not abundant, it is expensive, but lithium ion batteries will be there forever. Next generation batteries are sodium ion batteries, potassium ion batteries, and lithium metal batteries, uh, like lithium sulfur, that can give you three to five times higher energy density, but they come with their own problems. So typically, all of them, what we do is uh, try to explore new materials, but beyond that, are they safe? That is the fundamental question we are trying to dig down. With that, I will pass it to Casey. Green button. Thank you. Um, so I'm Keiji Zhang, I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering here. Uh, I got my bachelor from Xinjiang University of China, and then I, I went to Harvard for a master and a PhD degree. And uh, after that, uh, after spending two years as a postdoc at MIT, and I joined Purdue Mechanical Engineering. Um, so my research is mainly on mechanics and materials, and uh, I'm working on two types of materials. One is a redux, a redux active materials, mainly on battery materials. And their type of materials are polymeric materials, soft material. And uh, uh, in terms of battery materials, we developed operational experiments to uh, monitor the mechanical behavior of battery materials during operation of the batteries. And also uh, develop theories uh, and atomistic simulations to understand uh, how the mechanics and chemistry are coupled together. And in terms of polymer materials, we are working on uh, organic semiconductors and electrochromics. So uh, just in the context of the electro energy storage uh, for the battery materials, uh, we have two basic research questions to answer. The one is uh, how do electrochemical processes such as the uh, ion transport, uh, charge, uh, charge distribution, and uh, interfacial reaction, phase transformation, how those elements of electrochemical process induce the mechanics of the battery materials. And second of all is uh, how do the mechanical stresses and mechanical degradation influence the electrical performance, such as the capacity and voltage response and, uh, and uh, cyclic efficiency of battery materials. So those are the two basic research questions we're trying to answer. And um, in terms of the experiments, one of the highlights of the experiment is that we develop Auburn ex experiments try to uh, monitor the mechanical behavior of the materials during the charging and discharging process of the batteries. And also, through the understanding of the mechanics, we're trying to understand the chemistry, like uh, how, uh, what is the, the kinetic limiting process for a battery materials. 
And uh, uh, one highlight for the theoretical part is that we try to develop the computational modeling tools to uh, understand the mechanics failure and also the uh, battery performance and see how they couple together. So uh, that's pretty much about my research on batteries. All right, I'm James Fleetwood, uh, PhD out of Purdue actually, as well as bachelor's, and now I'm back again. So I guess I must like this place. Uh, since then, I've been at the Battery Innovation Center. Uh, I'll have a little bit more on the next slide about what, what the BIC is all about. But the core of what the BIC does and what I do is really more of the integration of what everyone else here on the panel learned. You know, there's so much good science already out there, so much more to learn, but a lot of what I do is catch the industry up with what everyone here is doing. And so I end up working with, working at more of a system level and integrating components. So it, with that, I've worked with just about every chemistry and component at this point. So we're talking high, high nickel intercalation cathodes, the lithium sulfur chemistry a lot, lithium air, which is extra challenging. Um, on the anodes, that's actually where uh, the majority of the work has probably been carbon series, particularly we're talking silicon, um, but anything in the carbon series, uh, composites thereof, particularly carbon composites, uh, and then uh, name of morphology. My favorites are rods, but uh, all of the above on that one. Um, electrolytes, again, typically we're talking about working at various additive structures and how to form better SEIs, more robust SEIs, high voltage stable SEIs, uh, room temperature ionic liquids, solid electrolytes being mostly polymer and sulfide, where polymer is, doesn't mean literally just polymer. Um, and again, since we're more of an integrator, what I work on is more the strategies of putting these together. So that's often, um, you know, there's often a lot of science on how every individual component behaves, but not necessarily how they interact with each other, um, particularly in a high performance environment. And that largely comes down to inefficient control, which is why I gave it a nice underline on the bullet points here. Um, otherwise, you're talking about, you know, electron lithium ion transport balance. You know, it's almost, you know, not often a big focus, but in some ways it's almost like your fuel air mixture in an engine. If these things aren't balanced, it actually can lead to a lot of other problems. Um, and with that comes, you combine the two of those and you have why you need surface protection methods, um, particularly for high voltage cathodes or they were talking about SEI uh, protection on the anode. Um, Another big area which does get more into the fundamental research side would be the secondary lithium sources. Uh, that's um, added components that are pre-lithiated, pre-lithiating electrodes electrolytically, um, or having some sort of phase decomposition compound that releases lithium into the other compounds, like the, the LMR NMC system where you have an Li2 MnO3 structure that breaks down but releases lithium and compensates for columbic efficiency and gives you uh, mitigating strategies to get high performance for moderate cycle life. Um, beyond that, it's all about rheological control to then develop uh, specific microstructures or heterostructures, which ties back into manufacturing processes. Oftentimes, I'm trying to translate, say, someone did chemical vapor deposition to create a battery, and it was amazing but I have to make it cheap, so I use, have to use tape casting, and I have to figure out a way to make a slurry solidify in a way that somehow approximates vapor deposition, which is also not easy. Um, beyond that, we're just talking about really any other component. Largely, those are about getting, efficient, getting things more efficient. Thinner, lighter, current collectors, separators. Uh, binders get a little bit more interesting where you're talking about not just sort of molecular weight uh, control or something like that, but functionalized polymers or block copolymers are getting pretty exciting for me on the conversion chemistries. Um, I, that's one where I, I'll lay, save that for the, one of the questions actually on the follow-up. Um, and generally conductive additives, the uh, key point there would, would probably be the term dispersed nanocarbons or fullerenes, so carbon nanotubes or graphene. Um, finding strategies to back to the microstructural design and the cost side 
to make a cost-effective battery with carbon nanotubes in it, you need like a quarter weight percent or half a weight percent of carbon nanotubes. If you could put all you wanted in there, you could create a great battery, but for cost, you need it to be a very small amount. And if you only have a quarter weight percent, you need to put it exactly where it's supposed to be uh, in order to have that impact. Uh, beyond that, um, much more on the practical side, dabbling in the modeling here, but the thermal transport optimization of EV pack design, that's one area that is way, way beyond, uh, behind the science. There are, the EVs on the road today are, are um, thermal behavior and transport was a second thought or a third thought in, in many cases, in, in the case of Tesla, they released their first electric vehicles without even doing anything about thermal transport. And now people are doing some, um, but there's still a lot of open, open area there I'll talk about. Uh, so taking a step back, just talking about the BIC and what the role is, I may have alluded to it a little bit in my work, um, but it really is, we're really supposed to be a bridge between universities and academia and industry or Department of Defense, Department of Energy. Um, we're a very collaborative entity, and so a lot of the reason I've worked with so many different projects is that um, we're almost like a user facility in some sense. You know, individual research groups or startup companies bring their individual material that they created to the BIC. I pull it together with other people's advances, and we create integrated systems. Um, and then we don't hold intellectual property, we protect intellectual property, and it's again, it's a way of innovating faster. One of the gaps between all the science we have and the actual industry we have is everyone being afraid that their ideas are gonna be stolen if they work with other people. You know, if you go back 100 years, which maybe is why we have this problem, Tesla and Edison, um, people used to work together a great deal more and share information very openly, and that kind of has pulled back and stopped, and the BIC is sort of an initiative to get us back to where we were, back to that fast innovation that we used to have. Um, and in, to do that, we offer a broad set of capabilities. Again, advanced cell manufacturing prototyping. We have about 2,000 square feet of less than 1% humidity dry room. If you want to work with raw lithium metal, you need a very dry place. And we can make cells from coin cells to pouch cells, 18650s. Uh, pretty much, you name it, we can build it from scratch. Uh, and then we can do any sort of test on that cell all the way up to megawatt hour systems. Just yesterday, I don't think I can name the company, but we blew up an electric vehicle pack. It was exciting. Um, usually, you don't intend for it to blow up, but you have to know what will happen when it does uh, in order to be safe. Uh, beyond that, again, applied research and consulting kind of across the board in the industry when people, I've helped set up electrochemistry labs in the US or uh, manufacturing facilities. Um, so we kind of consult uh, kind of across the board. We're a network entity, so when we, I don't have all these answers, but I know the people who have the answers, like Vilas, for instance, and I'll refer um, and connect again. Sort of this idea of sharing information, of networking together, of, of accelerating this innovation, and again, getting all this great science out into practical use, which we're so behind on. Uh, with that. Okay, so, wow, fascinating work. Let's give a quick applause to all the panelists for their wonderful scientific achievement. And we'll start our first panel discussion question. So the common word that you have heard a lot today from every single panelist are challenges. So what is the major technical challenge from your perspective in electrochemical storage nowadays? And what do you perceive as the best strategy to address those challenges. So we'll start with our distinguished lecturer today. So right, Dr. Well, Arthur, what do you think? <laughs> so well, first of all, thanks for organizing this panel. This is different, and it is good to learn about all the nice work that's going on at Purdue. So the, um, the major challenges, from my perspective, come in essentially three bins, right? So one bin is cost. We have to be able to make batteries that are cheaper, more accessible. The second bin is safety. We have to make batteries and battery systems that are safe at scale. And to give you a perspective on this, it's, you know, it's okay if one EV blows up. But it's not okay if you know, five blow up. And it's certainly not if they start blowing up in a chain reaction. 
And so I think this question of safety is likely to become even more important as the number density of EVs on the road becomes um, important. And I guess the third um, um, aspect, I think, is going to be manufacturing. I think the, um, I would argue that the barrier to um, implementation of some of the best ideas in science that you hear about isn't really that we don't know how to integrate them into cells, but we don't know how to manufacture them at reasonable cost. In other words, pretty much every battery manufacturing operation is a unique entity. And we need to learn how to leverage things like semiconductor fabs and that sort of processing to do battery processing at scale to be able to you know, have faster pathways for adoption of some of the cool things that are coming out in research. Thank you. Let's hear from Dr. Zapier. Thank you. Uh, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I would, I would add to that that the, the challenges that you refer to by themselves have their own challenges. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, mostly because uh, in, in order, for example, to understand the, the science behind improving the safety of the batteries, uh, one has to be able to have the experimental information both at the macro scale and at the microscopic scale. Right? Uh, at the macroscopic scale, uh, even though, uh, uh, as James was alluding, uh, uh, the, there's a lot of uh, fear of sharing data associated to the particular, uh, particular intellectual property, uh, us scientists are in great need of having the experimental data, both macroscopically and microscopically. Uh, macroscopically, for example, if you look at the published literature, maybe you can find uh, statistics on 150 cells, right? And that barely makes it in order to be able to understand what happens at the macro level. And at the microstructural level, or even mesoscopic level, even, I mean, even further down, uh, being able to understand how the batteries behave and having reliable data that we can then use to propagate into models and theories and designs, uh, I think uh, the industry has moved ahead so fast that left all, the, all that basic science behind. Uh, uh, I mean, and that's just from gathering the data. Uh, I mean, from, from where I stand, uh, and uh, in order to develop theories and models to describe it, uh, these days, for example, to predict the degradation, the failure of a cell, uh, what is done, the, the state of the art of, of being able to predict the degradation of a battery, uh, you, you do a, 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 an average model, and from that average model, you predict the degradation of the cell at most for, say, three months, right? And your code will run for two weeks. And then from there, you extrapolate uh, for two years and then try to make a conclusion based on that. I think uh, everyone in this room would agree that you cannot extrapolate uh, the equivalent of three months to two years or five years because there's a lot of stuff happening in the, in the, in, on the road conditions that are actually impacting on the degradation of that cell. And as, as a user, you don't want to use a cell that you fear or may fear that will fail in a catastrophic way. So uh, in that perspective, I think those are the two, at least two, two challenges that they, just the challenge of addressing safety, and we do one safe batteries, uh, uh, need to be addressed. Okay. Anyway. I'll pick that up from there. Um, first on the manufacturing point, which I want to support as strong, in as strong words as I can, um, and I want to give an example uh, a little bit more explicitly. So we've been dropping the cost dramatically in cells, uh, cell costs and pack costs in recent years, which is great, although really the reason is largely because of how poorly we were making them. Um, so there's so much room for improvement. <laughs> uh, the case is still there. Um, in fact, my biggest complaint about how we manufacture today, as much as I would love to even develop entirely new manufacturing processes, is that it's batch processing, um, which is really odd for the year that we're in um, people have invented the continuous manufacturing process pieces, applied it to other industries. Comically enough, a lot of the industry that we replaced had the continuous. So it's backstory on roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing, magnetic tape discs, and Kodak film. Those, when those became obsolete, we had all this leftover equipment, and we started applying it to batteries. And then we started just like, well, let's simplify it, and let's just keep doing it that way and let's not change things because we don't understand what those changes will do. And if you do a continuous, as 
the biggest argument I hear is, if you do continuous manufacturing, how are you going to track all those bad sales we're always making? Mm -hmm. you know, you, we have to know when we're each batch, because we have to throw entire batches out all the time. We have to have A, B, C, D, and F cells. You know, you make a few hundred liters of slurry, and the slurry may be stable the entire time, but it's not the same mm -hmm. throughout that time. You make a big roll of electrode, you coat one side, then you coat the other side, and now side one was dried a little differently than side two. Um, you calendar them in a fully dry state. You put them on these giant multi-hundred meter rolls and you try to vacuum dry them on these rolls, and so the outside ends up being more dried than the inside. The edges end up more dried than the inside. It's all inconsistency, and this is when I would go back to an analogy of corrosion, you know, batteries function very similarly to corrosion where the path of least resistance kills them. Um, any, any variation in a cell, that's the worst thing in the cell. We don't need to necessarily invent new chemistries or, or vast improvements to the fundamentals. We just need to make more uniform and consistent cells. And that's one of these things continuous manufacturing does. Um, and it also, of course, ultimately makes it cheaper as well. Uh, so that's that's what I'm a big proponent of, and again, the equipment basically exists. We, no factory in the world has currently installed an entire continuous manufacturing line. Um, beyond that, I would say if I went on the more fundamentals, it's probably um, electrolyte, electrode interface, uh, particularly SCI formation, even outside of lithium metal cells. Um, you know, I don't really like it when everyone describes the system as a phase mosaic. That doesn't sound very explicit to me. Um, with that, I might give the others a, a chance to talk. Okay, Dr. McConaughey. Thanks. From, from my perspective, we're trying to improve the performance of batteries, but we can't sacrifice the safety and reliability. And a lot of the safety and reliability challenges that have come up have been thermal perspective, or thermal driven. And as uh, James mentioned earlier, uh, thermal has often been in the back seat. So I think one of the major technical challenges is getting thermal engineers into the the driver's seat, let's say, and uh, integrating thermal design into the design of batteries. And so if you look at cylindrical cells in particular and show it to anybody who studies heat transfer, that geometry is one of the worst for dissipating heat. Uh, so uh, I think we radically need to think about is there a different geometry, let alone materials and chemistries uh, that could improve the performance of these batteries. Okay, I will take a different spin here. So we heard the fundamental problems. There are major five problems that I elaborated, and there is applied problem. But more than that, technologically, we are not making our own batteries even today. Tesla is making, but the technology is Panasonic. So the reason is the materials. Where are the materials? First of all, lithium cobalt oxide is a traditional cathode. We do not have enough cobalt now. Cobalt price is going up. Lithium price is also going up. There are only few mountains left in Bolivia and Chile uh, that has lithium source. And half of the lithium, whatever they produce, China already bought it. So we have limitations. So that is a technological problem to all electrochemical energy storage devices. We will have lithium ion batteries, but certainly we will have to go beyond that in order to store all our renewable energy at some point. Uh, so lithium ion battery has challenges, similarly other Electrochemistries has challenges, but major problem is rely on the material science and chemistry. Where is the material? What are the materials? And then the problem comes, it is thermally safe, unsafe, how much energy you can dissipate or not, but the problem lies on materials. I might uh, just add one point about uh, the challenges, significant challenges regarding our battery materials. In addition to the three uh, pillars, uh, safety, cost, and uh, Manufacturing, it's, I think it's one another significant challenge is very difficult to push the frontier of the performance of the battery uh, because the battery is a truly complex system. And we, we often joke that uh, when you solve one problem in battery, you often create 10 more problems in batteries. I think it, uh, it comes from the complexity in two sense. One is it's a really complex in terms of the material system. It's, it contains hard materials and soft materials and liquid materials and interfaces. And uh, when you innovate one, one part of the materials, and then you need to have the same innovation of the system. So this is really a system, engine, a system engineering. So if we think about the Moore's law for computer chips, 
the innovation for battery is far, far below the innovation pace for the computer chips. Uh, there's challenges comes from the complexity of the science behind it. I, I would say that uh, battery is a truly multi-skill system from, from down to the atom scale, micro scale to the micro scale. And also it's a, a multi-physics system. It comes from the chemistry, uh, the physics, uh, materials, and mechanics more recently. Um, so, uh, for example, I'm working on mechanics and materials, and we're particularly concerned about the mechanical degradation, those uh, fracture and debounding and the fatigue of the battery materials. Uh, as uh, Professor Garcia commented, that uh, this mechanical degradation has become a limiting factor for like a solid state of battery materials and for those high capacity materials. And how to understand if we want to push forward those uh, high energy density battery materials and mechanical degradation will become a really issue, a bottleneck issue. So um, that's my comment. Well, now we have heard all about the challenges. As an engineer, what do we want to do next is we want to come up with solutions. So this leads to the next question that I want to ask all the panelists. So we have engineers working different sectors, industry sector, academic sector, or someone like Dr. Fleetwood who works to connect us. So how can advances in fundamental science can contribute to the design of next generation electrochemical energy storage system? So we have already heard an example from the wonderful talk from Dr. Archer today. So, and I want to have the panelists share their opinions um, about this particular questions. And we'll actually start with Dr. Flitwood, so he can tell us what is his view from the other side of the fence. Oh, great, great. Um, I won't dig more into the interfacial stuff because admittedly that was top on the list. Um, I would say beyond that, um, a few more phase diagrams would be nice. In terms of the complexity of the system, I'm asking for quaternary plus phase diagrams from you. Could you, could you get me that for uh, every structure of manganese oxide, for instance, that can, that can exist and every substitution possible? That would be great. Um, that's maybe asking a lot. Uh, I think there still is some on the, on the fundamental materials that aren't there um, and the, some of the formation mechanisms. I think a, another area I would say that's maybe more of a methodology on the fundamental science is going back to the complexity of the system. Oftentimes, in order to get, um, in order to get a result, the sim system is simplified so much that you can still learn from it. It still, it still gives you a step. Um, but sometimes it's maybe oversimplified, as you actually gave a good example of. Um, and with that, you know, my greatest complaint is usually when we talk about electrode formulations that, that people use in a lot of journal articles, like you see a lot of by weight electrode formulations, which is already a problem. Uh, when you go into the lab and you mix something and it's a solid, yeah, you weigh mass. But when you talk about the function of the electrode, the mass does not really have much relevancy. And so it's already saying, well, why are we standardizing to 801010 or 8955? It doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, the other side of that is you think of a one-to-one -one comparison. You say, well, I took five materials and I analyzed, I characterized them in this way, and every one of them was 955, because that's one-to-one. -one. And oftentimes, I've, you know, when I go back and I try and repeat someone's result and I look through it, it's like, yeah, I got that result. Uh, that formula is best for that material. The result wasn't that result. You found an optimized formula for one material that happened to be 95.5 or closer to 95.5. Another one might have been 91.45, you know, a little, little tiny change. It goes back to this idea of it being a system. And again, I sometimes use it as a, a rough analogy of thinking of an engine just because I usually feel like people understand engines a little bit more where um, you know the chemistry side might be saying it's a gas engine or a diesel engine but the exact you know the exact fuel to air mixture the size of, of and length of crank arms and everything even though we don't think of a battery as a, having moving parts it is extremely dynamic as we kind of saw with some of your presentation there are a lot of moving parts they're just microscopic or nanoscopic. And so there, you still have to kind of design it like a machine. Uh, 
back to the chemistry example, if you tried to do a one-to-one -one gasoline to diesel comparison with one engine, well, only one of them might work, and you're not going to really find out what you need. And so th that would be some of my complaints there. Okay. So next generation uh, electrochemical energy storage devices, you might have heard that uh, we need to put more than one electron into the system. Lithium ion, li lithium plus, only one lithium shuttles back and forth. We have to find two or three multivalent uh, electrons which can be shuttled back and forth. So magnesium chemistry can do that, Mg2 plus, calcium can do that. But there is a problem everywhere. The anode is a problem, cathode is a problem, electrolyte, nobody knows what can work. Uh, also the cost and other benefits we will, we will have to look at. So typically the next generation batteries that we are thinking to come to the market could be sodium ion technology. Sodium is abundant and inexpensive. However, the problems lies on sodium is completely different. SEI layer formation and shuttling of sodium into uh, amorphous carbon versus graphitic carbon is totally different. So we cannot just mimic the chemistry of lithium ion and put it on the sodium ion and say that it works. So all the fundamentals that we are trying to dig down with all advanced techniques that we have today, advanced photon source, variety of X-rays, x technology, or in-situ TM, and many others, that is the way we are trying to dig down the fundamentals, how that next generation batteries are going to come to us and what are the problems. So there are many problems and solutions for the next generation batteries, as you know. Uh, last 30 years, we did not progress too much. Uh, Sony was the first company to bring the batteries to us, typically lithium ion batteries, 1991. And until now, from that time, we did not progress too much. Uh, we might have increased the capacity by 50% or so, but not that more than that. So in order to go to next, next generation batteries, uh, such as lithium sulfur system, where uh, two lithium can be uh, connected to sulfur, Li2S chemistry, we will have the battery three times much more energy dense. But the problem, everybody was saying that uh, nobody knows the safety aspect. Our group is the first one. We are digging down how safe those batteries are. And we had a very good discussion today, actually. We are making safer batteries than we have today in your cell phone, using multivalent system where we can store more energy, and still make the batteries safer. So there are pros and cons. We will need five to 10 more years. Okay. Uh, uh, I found very interesting uh, your comment about the, the quaternary phase diagram, uh, uh, mostly because I, I feel, from my side of the fence, I feel the same way about asking to the industrial part of the fence, right, uh, as to, hey, you have any data so I can figure out the quaternary phase diagram. So I think, it, I think to me, the, the biggest issue is in closing the gap between what uh, the, the, the industrial side may have and what the academic side may have. To me, that, that's one, uh, one issue, right? And let's just, say, let's just pretend for a second that I happen to have that quaternary phase diagram, then what do I do with it, right? Because if I have the fanciest chemistry in the world uh, that in, in my benchmark laboratory or, or in my computer, it's telling me, that this is gonna be the next big thing in rechargeable battery technology, I still need to figure out the science from scaling that up, okay, which, and then processing becomes a huge deal, right, so that they, that power and energy density doesn't get diluted as I go up from the smallest length scale all the way to the, to the new electric vehicle, okay? And, and to me, that's really the, the, the biggest issue on being able to scale that up, right? To, to scale it up in a consistent way. Well, I not only account for the average response of the cell, but to the error bar, because one, one single cell will give me one voltage as a function of time. If I look at tens of thousands of cells, it, that will give me a whole distribution, and if I am on they just pretend for a second that I'm trying to sell an electric vehicle on a lot. I have to convince the buyer that that particular cell is going to be worth the money of the person that's trying to, be, to, to buy it, right? That actually that person that is going to buy that electric vehicle, he will save money from using that car. And I think that science is not there yet. And I, I think if we develop that fundamental science, you know, from atoms all the way to the, to the lot, I think that... I think that would be a, a huge deal. Okay, that's, that's. 
and, and I'll just echo those sentiments, but my thoughts were that we need to break down the barriers uh, both on campus and academia between uh, different research areas, and then also between academia and industry. Um, I was going to point out, and it has been already, we often do small scale experiments in the lab and we need to gain the trust of the industry partners uh, to get those things implemented in the next generation systems. I'm only 100 miles away, just come on by. <laughs> Sure, I, I think it's, there's no doubt that the fundamental science is a driving force for the technology. Uh, I, I want to add to the other side a kind of comment that uh, I think this uh, battery technology or energy storage technology actually brings tremendous opportunity for academia as we are, right? So uh, it's, uh, there are many questions we, we, we never thought about actually. For example, in the chemistry field, uh, there is a very little uh, uh, consideration or theoretical framework on how to consider how the stress regulates the chemical process, like ion transport and the charge transfer and uh, phase transformation. And uh, similarly, for the mechanics field, there's um, not much work has been done how to consider the chemical driving forces into how those chemical processes are driving, driven uh, the mechanical degradation, and mechanical failure during some materials. So I think. Uh, uh, one side is how we use this, uh, the fundamental science to drive the technology development. On the other side is probably we can take advantage of this technology to consider the, the new frontier or to, to branch or new science at this interface of physics and chemistry and mechanics. Yeah, so, so I'll just say two things. So a lot of really good points um, have already been made. But so, you know, I want to step back a little bit and just um, point out that the rechargeable battery won the Nobel Prize last year for a good reason. It is an exceptional device. Mm -hmm. And so if you listen to the discussion up here, you might think that it's a mediocre technology, but I challenge you to find any other closed system, closed system that can operate for three years continuously without fail and retain 80 plus percent of its initial energy. It is just remarkable. And I challenge you further to think of this. The, um, all of the electrolytes that are in current use today are reductively unstable at the potentials of the anode inside this battery that I just described, this closed system. So I think that um, the reason why the lithium ion technology, this generation, has been so resilient is that it's just so exceptional in terms of its ability to retain, retain charge and uh, prevent um, degradation over extended periods of time that I'm not aware of any other chemical system that has that sort of um, durability um, over time. Now, when I think of the next generation, so one of the things that has influenced me a lot is that I started a company about um, seven or eight years ago out of technology that came out of my group. And one of the things I, I learned is that the next generation is actually not decided by any of us, but decided by the market. That ultimately, the next generation is set by the things people are willing to pay for at the cost that you're willing to make it. And when I look at what the future looks like, I see basically two things as the drivers for that adoption. I see the emergence of autonomous robotics um, that absolutely are gonna need batteries. And they are likely not going to be the ones that we are using today, in part because, as I started with, those technologies will be interfacing directly with humans. And so the um, room for error in terms of safety is going to be zero, and insurability is going to be a pretty substantial factor in terms of their um, acceptance. And so thinking about systems that are intrinsically safe, I think solid state is one of the things that people have um, um, essentially um, converged on because of the fact that there's no volatiles and so fail is likely safe. And so I think breakthroughs in terms of being able to understand transport in solids, being able to maintain this high durability over time in solids is going to be important. I think of the other driver, and the other driver is just the tremendous cost reductions we've seen in energy generation from renewable technologies. Now, that sector has no patience for high cost. If you cannot get the cost of whatever the next generation technology is below two cents a kilowatt hour, no one cares what it is. 
And I think because a pretty substantial part of getting to that target is really about how long you amortize the acquisition cost, it means that you have to develop systems that are sort of quasi-open. And so this is where things like the flow batteries and so forth that you may have heard about, I believe, excel. Because these systems allow us to um, essentially do what the lithium-ion technology is able to do, but in an open format that allows us to fix errors um, as the system progresses in time. There is, um, I, I know my moderator wants me to stop, but, <laughs> but I'll make one last observation. I think there's another scale of opportunity, and that scale of opportunity, I think, comes from the world of data sciences, where we now have capabilities to collect tons and tons of data and to basically reduce the data into um, kind of parsimonious, minimalistic, analytical forms that allow us to use um, cheaper controllers. And so I think um, a, a, a battery future in which we begin to think of the cells as belonging in a pack, where all of the members of the pack don't have to do the same thing, don't have to be the same. But they can be designed to excel at individual things, and we utilize the tools of data science and systems control to integrate function over that pack. I think that, to me, looks like a future that might be affordable, that can meet the needs of the new technology. Now, I think it's a good time for us to open the forum of discussion to all of the audience. I'm sure we have questions here. Okay, so we'll start with you. I would be interested in knowing the perspective or views on recycling of the batteries. So he's my student, you should take the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, um, so I sit on the board of, I think, the only company in the US that recycles lithium ion batteries. And I kind of urge you to think about this. Um, upwards of 97% of the lead that is used in your car lead acid battery was in another battery in a previous lifetime. And so we kind of know how to do this and to maintain cost in the context of lead acid batteries. And why do we know how to do it so well? We know to do it well because there's a penalty on it. Lead is dangerous, toxic, and so forth. And so recycling it is actually a requirement. The, um, I think a similar paradigm has to develop. And it's a very interesting paradigm. Because you hear lots of discussion about, you know, let's remove cobalt because we have a low supply or the U.S. market, um, it's, it's expensive. But if you think about that from the perspective of a recycler, cobalt is actually the most valuable part of the battery. If you remove it, what is the incentive to recycle that battery? And so my view is that to, um, to, to, to make progress, we've got to now integrate recyclability in the cost factors of the battery. We have to integrate the so-called life cycle cost when we decide which technologies uh, to pursue. I can say a lot more, but I'll stop there. Uh, I, I just want to add to, uh, to, to what you just said. Uh, uh, last time I checked, uh, in the world, there are really two plants that are recycling batteries. One is in Detroit, and the other one is in Barcelona. Uh, the rest of the batteries, if you want to recycle them, first you burn them in, a, in this big open field in Africa, and then from there you move it around, right? Uh, that by itself, uh, at least to me, it, it, I, I found that an outrage that that's, what, that's what's happening now. I don't know, and I don't know if it's still happening, uh, but as uh, lithium resources, uh, as, as Bilas pointed out, that uh, uh, the amount, the number of mines are limited and they're being depleted, uh, the next mining field is going to be the is going to be the trash can, right? And I think you will find probably more lithium in a battery that you toss than than in a in a depleted mine. And I think in that sense, even if we remove, I think that even if we remove cobalt, I think there are going to be a lot of uh, how do they call them uh, uh, trash di divers? You know, the, the people that actually go and look. Yeah, th there will be a lot of professional dumpster divers. Uh, uh, trying to get the, the lithium well, out. So can I, add, yeah, so I think that, um, the, you know, the nice thing about, and someone mentioned this already, the interesting thing about batteries and storage from my perspective is how quickly you can transfer fundamental knowledge into a device and you can learn relatively quickly 
whether your ideas are good or bad. And I, in chemical engineering, that's usually hard to make an innovation and to evaluate it in a device that actually is um, morphologically the same as the real thing. I mean, in detail, it may be different. And so that's important. But the other element is how things are coupled. And so you make an interesting point about trash divers. But actually, trash diving for batteries is actually fundamentally unsafe. Yeah, that's right. And unsafe from the personal perspective. I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. and so, so one of the, um, the, the huge challenges really is going to come from, um, you know, how do we recycle batteries, right? The, the process of recycling typically, typically begins with crushing the cell. Crushing is a short. If the battery shorts in a fully charged state, it's a fire hazard. If we're recycling this by low-skilled workers who are trash divers, it's a problem. And so coming up with some framework that um, anticipates the full life of batteries, anticipates the need to extend the life of the materials, perhaps by recycling, I think is one of the grand challenge questions. How do we do it as a society without being too interventionalist in terms of you know, what EVs and so forth um, um, end up using. I, I, I just want to add to what you just said. You're absolutely right. I, I should have mentioned that too. Uh, and one of the biggest issues there on recycling batteries uh, as compared to solar panels that you have already standards in the sizes and shapes. Yes. In batteries, we don't have those standards, yes. right? And, and that will make our, for a robot to come and start disassembling a battery very difficult, right? And uh, uh, probably uh, uh, the development of artificial intelligence that allows for a robot to to manipulate a, a cell and from there figure out what to do with it as to how to peel the different layers and toss them into different buckets. I think uh, that's an interesting already mechanical engineering problem, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah. I'm, I would like to add slightly different view on that. Uh, where we are talking about recycling, there is a fire hazard and you might have seen the batteries are on fire, Tesla was on fire. So batteries has electrolyte, it has a salt, LIPC, LIPF6, lithium hexafluorophosphate, with electrolyte. When it is on fire, it forms hydrofluoric acid, HF. And HF is highly, highly corrosive to our lungs. So whenever you see something is on fire, like batteries, you should not go on taking the video. You should really run away from that. <laughs> the reason is your life could be on danger. And Electric vehicle has eight to 9,000 batteries. Total amount of HF generated will be in kilograms, might be. And that much, if you can inhale or if you are nearby, it could impact today or tomorrow or at some point. It could be a really dangerous thing. That actually is one of my fear of chronic concern for like firefighters and so forth is mm -hmm. typically the amount of HF is PPM, less than 10. So it's, it's unlikely to kill you unless the carbon dioxide is going to kill you. Uh, so typically, the carbon dioxide will kill you first in any given instance. Um, not that that's a plus. Um, but the chronic effect of HF is, is very uh, questionable, especially since one of its other effects is to deplete the protection around your neurons. And so it's the one acid that typically doesn't physically burn you as a sense um, until it's way, way too late. Uh, so that's pretty scary. There's one more point I know we're probably going to go on, but I will say that we're kind of on a cusp of getting better on recycling. One of the challenges has been, in the past, we were much more recycling individual cells where there's no knowledge about the history of that cell, even what the chemistry in that cell is. And so most, most remanufacturing is, yeah, you grind it all up, you assume there's kind of a blend of LCO and NMC and so forth, and it's just not quite as good as it used to be. If you have EV companies, you have, they plan for Second Life, so Second Life is not recycling, it's reusing it in like a grid storage application, or refreshing the electrolyte or lithium supply and reusing it. Um, and then it's, once it goes into manufacturing, imagine a million electric vehicles with the same chemistry being recycled. That's easier to do. And I'll stop. Yep. Well, let's make sure that we definitely recycle our batteries. So with this, we'll conclude our panel today. Let's thank all our panelists for a wonderful discussion. <laughs> and before we end the day, let's give a big applause to all the engineering supporting staff because they are the unsung hero for making this event happen. Thank you all for participating.